Hi, Bill. Hey, good morning. Good morning. What's it cold down there in Florida? What's going on? I know. I know. I've got a sweatshirt rather than my t-shirt on. It was 44 this morning when I got up. Wow, that is cold. Yeah. It's not Miami. I know. It's uh our our first real cold front came through. Yeah. Others have been helpful, but this one this one had a had a little bit of teeth in it. Yeah. That's chilly at the Golden Gate, that's for sure. You say it's chilly, Michael? Yeah, yeah. We've been in the 40s overnight. <clears throat> we had a big storm come through uh, here. Did you get snow in New York? No, it just it was rain. In fact, there was the lightning and the thunder was, you know, so, summer like. Yeah. If, if it, it's 2020, what else can we expect? Weird weather. I know. Hi, John. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm okay. Yourself? Good. Good. How was Thanksgiving? Um, small, but quality. How about yourselves? Yeah, I'd say the same in our case. So, what's going on? Duncan. Hi, Duncan. Hey, Good morning. How are you guys? Hi, Joe. Hi, Sarah. So, Sarah, we're going to teach you, maybe even here, how to, you're on mute though, how to do, how to manipulate the slides. Hey, Mark. How are you? Hanging in there. How are you? Good, good. Hi, Nisa. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good, yourself? Good, thank you. Hey, Mark. Yes, Sarah. Are you going to be able to do the bio slides and the movement when they get queued? We'll, we'll do. Actually, Jace is going to do it, but yeah. Great. Hi, Doug Jones. Is this a first? You're on mute, though. Got a lot of Denny dudes on here. Sarah, do you know Peter? Peter Craddock. Peter Craddock. Yes, I don't know if he knows me, but I know Peter. Okay. Hi, hi, Sarah. Hi, Peter. We were at school together. Oh, okay. What's your last yeah. name? Uh, it was Brownstein. Okay. Yep. I'm vaguely, vaguely. Yeah. And How are Doug, you doing? Doug Jones, oh, you, you, is this the first you've been on, on one of these? Uh, I've been on a few, not too oh, yeah, many. Okay. okay, you've been quiet. You haven't shown your video, but good to see you. Good to be Peter, on. you're in you're in the Bay Area, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I am. am I. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe we could connect uh, uh, offline. Yeah. After That'd be call. great. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, good morning. Hi, Dominic. Just saying hello to everybody. and. Kevin in Atlanta. Hi, how's it going? Good, good, thanks. Great. All right. Well, let me just get started. You, you, you see the screen on the events. Um, one thing on just a, by show of hands, who, who does not receive the weekly digest? So everybody gets it. Okay. Including you, Doug? Okay, um, so t today at 11.30, um, we have education in focus, and uh, I wanna come back to that in a second, Sarah. 
little Mark Jarvis. Um, reminds me, Jace, do we have uh, Stephen Burke's slides uploaded? Let's make sure we do. Yep, I'll we'll look at it. He's got some really great slides uh, on uh, on education as it relates to the Biden administration. Great. Um, oh, this is, by the way, we don't we we didn't, we didn't worry to fit in Lisa, but by the way, I know I saw that. Here she was uh, in July, just so you know. So she's she has continuity with us, but that's great that she's able to join. Yeah. Uh, Bill Doikler, um, do you want, I mean, I, I guess there are a couple of things. Do you want to maybe make some comments about um, Thursday morning? I mean, we can talk offline about the logistics and getting, um, Jace is going to send a bunch of, of uh, invites out when we, and we've got, I was up, I was overloaded on my LinkedIn. I was not only able to make invites, but now I am able to. So you'll see like, you probably see about 50, 60 people joining here soon on the LinkedIn side, but you want to make any comments? Cool. Um, sure, I'll, I'll 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 do the do the pitch here. So we're going to have uh, update number three on the virus and vaccine coming up this Thursday at 11:30. Uh, we're going to do a two-hour session. Um, we uh, Steve Cucciaro and Vishal uh, uh, Gladi uh, will be joining us again. I don't know if if you guys remember them from last time. Very helpful. Very interesting viewpoints. We were very fortunate uh, to be able to get Glenn Grossman uh, to join us from Novartis, uh, courtesy of a referral from our favorite person, Stephen Burke. So um, he had heard Glenn uh, speak previously. Glenn is, is sort of a little bit more on the business side rather than the medical side uh, for Novartis, but nonetheless, he is uh, an epidemiologist by training and has, uh, and has spoken a lot on that particular aspect of the virus. So um, uh, we're particularly excited you know, to have him join the panel. So come one, come all uh, this Thursday at 1130. Stephen, we were just singing your, I think the words were used, our favorite person when they <laughs> mentioned uh, was the, it's a different kind of honorarium. This group uh, needs an upgrade. <laughs> 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 so, but that's good. Um, I'm going to stop playing sounds when people come and go. There we go. So then uh, uh, I think it's going to be, you know, a lot of data, I have to say that, that they're coming forward on and that's great. Um, and, uh, but I, we wanted to talk about investments, but maybe that'll be a focus of virus update four. Oh, yeah, no, th thanks for, for kicking that in. Yeah, we do, we do want to try to uh, hit on that and spend some time on you know various opportunities. Uh, you know the the plan. Steve, uh, you know, kind of runs a public market fund, and Vishal is is more on the private markets. So you know we've got both aspects you know covered, and I've asked them to you know put their thinking caps on and uh, you know talk about some some ideas. Uh, Jonathan may or may not uh, be be able to join us. So uh, yours truly will be up. Uh, stepping in as as a moderator. <laughs> so you all can pray for me. You're the, you're the best six man uh, I've I've seen. You're you're like the one that comes and you know, I, I, I anytime you want to be on any event, uh, you're you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So then um, on that afternoon, our, it's our first afternoon event. Uh, Simon Vine, Erica Orange, Gary. Denise, Ronnie, all of which could probably do their own event, but so it's quite a, in terms of like the thinking about the future crowd, um, it's going to be a very interesting group. Uh, this slide's not finished, but Erica is going to talk about uh, what you call cyber hybrids. And you really, when you start going into the Z and the alphas, particularly alphas, sort of like alpha one, two, three technologies changing so fast that they're what's shaping them. Uh, is very different, so you can't throw a broad brush. And then Gary has his own, you know, structure as it relates to, you know, you know, decentralization, DeFi, de, de everything. Uh, and then next week, uh, you know, Publis's head of strategy or former global head of strategy is going to do a fireside chat. And then on the fifteenth, we've got Greg. The University of Pittsburgh CIO, 4.2 billion uh, endowment, going to give his perspectives on 
really those six questions or the five questions, reflections, predictions, maybe not as much goals and asks, but we'll, I'm gonna try to make everybody stick to that. Um, and then we switch to a half hour on the social development goals. That's where uh, we get to the foundation and then a family office out of UAE, um, the Narayan family, uh, who's focused on also Make-A-Wish. Um, and that's, we're gonna show a highlight reel of our uh, podcast. And if you haven't seen it, in fact, let me put this entire, Jace, can you throw this, uh, this entire Google slide deck into the chat so people can access all the links? So, um, you know, some of these people you've seen before, are actually gonna see Lisa Coleman again today. Um, and, you know, the, the format, first I'll just say, um, there's a survey, if you go to 360firm.onefirm.com forward slash 2021, you've got those same questions and they all go into a spreadsheet. That would be great if you could do it. Um, it turns out like this, for what Esther did. And then it helps you if you're gonna do the video, you already have your script, it's already done. And uh, you know, then she did it. Um, you don't need me, you can just do it yourself and upload it right here to our Google folder. Um, so, you know, literally right here, it takes you and you just hit new file upload. So. It's as simple as that. So you don't need me um, to interview you. Of course, it's nice. I'm finding that as I do these interviews, we have like a little bit of time after. And it's really this, it's a reflective, interesting, deep, funny uh, six minutes. Uh, and then we talk afterwards. So it's a, it's, I really enjoyed these sessions. So, you know, Esther is really focused on, she thinks the insurance industry is in for a complete revamp. And then, you know, she's been investing in space and frontier tech. Um, Simon, uh, I mean, you can sort of see how we do it. This is the unedited version. Um, oh, this is, sorry, this is Esther. As executive founder of Wealth, which is a team. So we're going to do a highlight reel and we're going to associate these with people's profiles and then try to look back next year and see if we are right or wrong. Um, then... Um, hey, hey, Mark, could, could yeah. you go back to Esther's page just for a second? Yep. That was pretty Please. helpful. Here? Yeah, we yeah. want to copy what you wrote, Mark. <laughs> it, literally, I'll, I'll, I'll go get a coffee. You can read it. Um, it's, uh, it's too small, I, I assume. I always get that. Her one word is next chapter. Um, really interesting concept of this Wellville. She's creating five communities and sort of catalyzing what can happen when people think long-term. And, uh, and then, you know, she's still an investor, but you, you, have, you all have this, uh, did you put it in the link, um, uh, Jace? Yes. All right, good. So she's great. And she'll be speaking um, live and doing Q&A on December 15th with us. So again, okay, thank you. The other thing, I, I flashed this before, but I don't wanna underscore it. It's, it's a really beautiful program we put together and we're just finishing populating it um, that it's called Batch Geo. And you're able to basically search you know, by keyword, or you can visually search geographically, hover over, um, you know, it used to be that we traveled, right? So we would go to, you know, Pittsburgh and who do I know? So this is a bit of, a bit like that, um, but would also have some better advanced search features than our app has. Um, and this doesn't have everybody in there, but obviously we're, we're rather North American centric um, but we're trying to be more and more global. Uh, just a reminder on the ecosystem, you know, the way we are um, thinking about it, uh, we're going to spend a lot more time on that second column, this, what we call the SPIFES, so it's Sovereign Wealth, uh, Pension Insurance Foundation Endowments. We're having a couple of sessions just for uh, the SPIFES and the family principals, CIOs, because they can learn from each other. 
Um, so you'll see more of that, um, more on the STGs. And then, um, yeah, well, there, the other thing is there's a philanthropic survey that um, we're, frankly, we're re revamping a bit, but if you haven't been to the app, you can just fill in your, your philanthropic interests, um, you know, whatever you want to subscribe to, get on the app. Uh, now, some people, I just want to, does anyone feel like they know the basics of the app or is it worth my um, showing this for 60 seconds? I wouldn't mind taking a review. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Go to 361fern-honeycomb2ounce.com to register for the app. Enter your name and email. You will then receive a confirmation email. Create a username. We ask that you keep it as transparent as possible, meaning first name, last name. The next step is onboarding. And note that you can change these answers later. Your answer to AUM is strictly for compliance and is shown only to you privately, not on your public profile. To see other members to follow, go to the search bar and click on members. You can enter a name in the search bar as well. To see potential groups to join, click on groups. Most are open, but some will be gated, meaning you need to request to join. Others will be closed, meaning you'll be invited to join. If you are on the web version, your profile is accessible in the right-hand corner. If you're on the iOS version of the app, you can see your profile on the left-hand side. Our events are set up as groups and accessible via the groups page. If you are on the iOS app version, you can also direct message other members. So that's the, uh, there are new, new features happening. There's, a, there's an events feature. There's the ability to, to direct message multiple people like in Skype and um, you know, a number of other things that are about to happen, but uh, let me just go back to the calendar. If anybody, ha this is where we people have ideas on issues or sorry, event topics, or they want to talk about their event. Um, you know, for each of these, and again, you have the link. Um, the registration links are in there. The LinkedIn events um, are in there, uh, which I know you've you've seen. Um, you can see you can invite connections. You can invite them. You know all your your Denison or Wharton, or whoever you know it is, um, Adam Weinberg or Rob, Bam, and uh, there's also a deck. So let's say uh, we've created for each group that's sort of starting to form. You have your own deck. You'll have it up until the time that it's complete, and we give you in the deck sort of what to do and. Uh, you know, some people are better at this than others, um, but then it's got, we, we link everything, including events that are coming up and whatnot. So, um, so we have like, yeah, Kyle Hong is doing Korean conglomerates. I know Michael Daly, we talked about tax. We just, there was a couple other Anderson guys on the call Wednesday and tomorrow we go through the details of the, of the Africa is going to be a, you know, a big topic in the sense of um, like 20 people showed up for Africa. Um, and we've got the head of uh, uh, Renaissance Capital's chief glo global economist and they're basically their chief strategist for Africa are gonna provide two 15 minute, con minute presentations to kick it off, which is gonna be great. Um, we try to do that with India as well. Um, but let me stop and just, what, what do people wanna focus on? Which, what should we be prioritizing? Doug, you're new. I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what, what topics, any of these topics interest you, or is there another topic? Well, some of these, uh, Africa, India, things like that are, uh, very interesting, but they're less applicable to what, you know, my, my small little world. But, um, you know, it seems like once everyone fills out the, uh, questionnaire, you'll have a real good sense of, uh, you know, the direction that everybody, you know, kind of the mass wants to head in. So then you can follow that. 
Well, I, yeah. I, I haven't filled that out yet, so I should probably do that. Fair enough. But if you, you know, if you, I know, so Doug is investing in different classes of real estate uh, that have been doing this for a while. You're also the CIO of a rather large group at one, like 10 years ago, was um, blanking on it. Uh, just different hedge funds. Hedge funds don't have a long lifespan though. So they're all, uh, you know, they've all, they've all gone by the wayside, but they were, they were quite good at the time. But uh, now I just do real estate. Yeah. Fair enough. Anyone else with comments, questions on or ideas? I mean, I, I just, Mark, I, I'm not sure I've got an idea, but it's, it's interesting. If you'd have asked me a year ago, I'd have said, yeah, India, Africa, very important. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, no, I'd rather see something more close to home. I, I mean, I know that I'm in a COVID mindset here, um, but well, more, it, it, it feels to me, without thinking it through, that right now the, the more close to home things are the more more important so what would that be what would, what would be well you know the, the, the education one that you've got going i mean it's is you know it is perfect you know about about how we get on top of our kids and working with them and things like that i mean that's 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 certainly one um you know hospitality industry you know how will it revamp how will it, it's those so again, I'm sorry, I haven't thought this through, so I'm speaking aloud, but those sorts of things is what's on my mind every day. Kind of philanthropy um, is, is clearly a, a key one. Um, so it's just that that I used, you know, you, you know me for years, you know, I used to have that more broader vision of, yeah, it's important to me what happens in Africa. And it's like, yeah, it is, but let's think about now in my little town, you know. Fair enough. I'm guessing I'm, I'm uh, we're trying to find that balance. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally, totally, totally agree. And then that, like, you used to, you would go to India how many times a year? Yeah, yeah, five, six times a year. So, so you need to get me out of that doldrum. But you know, it's just I think that's where your audience is, perhaps a, a bit more introspective, um, given where we are. Mark, <clears throat> yep. I think it'd be interesting if we did a future of Europe uh, one. Because I, yeah, I sense we're getting closer to the uh, to newer answers in that in that space, um, particularly given the financial fallout that's coming from the pandemic is going to put greater strains on the union, and it's coming at the same time as Brexit, what, whatever that is. I'm not even sure I could even respond, but. I think we're at one of those points where the future of Europe is one that would be worth discussing more. I assume that's close enough to home, Europe, for you, Mark Jarvis. Europe. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously we're not part of Europe anymore, uh, clearly. But uh, <laughs> but you're totally right. I think you know you're seeing a lot of dynamics with um, Poland and Hungary, and um, I, I think um, it's definitely worth a topic there. Yes. Well, it's interesting. The institutional crowd tells me, because I've been asking this, and there's like the revamp survey, is that, you know, you look at, in, like, you're not, Indonesia is probably not on your radars, right? Or India, for that matter. But on a PPP basis, India is going to overtake the U.S., with, you know, sooner than you think. And Indonesia is not too far behind. So I'm just trying to have people, and then, of course, Asia, but we'll, we'll find the balance. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the future of Europe is an easy one for us to do. I just think a lot of people do it, but we could do it. Mm. What else? Nobody you, does it like 361 it, from. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you just you just you just came up for the highlight reel there. Okay. Hey Mark, can I get the screen for a sec? Yep. Thank you. This is why I can't find my deck. Okay, so Mark, what might be interesting to do, um, and it's kind of a real time thing, is as people smarter than I am are able to read the tea leaves of what the, the Biden administration um, may be doing, 
whether it's with green energy and the impact on fossil fuels or, um, or, or, or other things, whether it's, it's taxes, yeah, but, but it may be a work in progress to really start to you know, think about what the next four years may look like from a, um, a policy uh, perspective and a, and, a, and a laws perspective to understand you know, what the impact will be that, on the changing dynamic um, economically. Steve's going to. Unfortunately, Jim, I think we're going to have to wait till uh, January sixth. So I'm thinking. I'm thinking January nineteenth, but you're more optimistic than I am. <laughs> well, we. Yeah, we actually. All right, fair, fair enough. We'll just say late Jan. You're going to talk a little bit about that, Stephen, today. Just the education part, but. Um, I do think that, Mark, there is, uh, if we can get Andy LaPerriere from uh, Cornerstone, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's excellent in this area. On the po political side. On the political yeah. side. I mean, we had this here, right? The future of the US Senate um, tied to, you know, sort of, obviously there's similar. Yeah, it's an interesting question about how how short term, near term, and long term do we start thinking? Um, you know, because if we start changing administrations every four years and we start changing you know, macro policies every four years, you know, you're forced to really have a, a short term uh, view on uh, on your investment horizon. Biden, Biden said he's only, be, he's only going to be a one-term president. So you know, that guarantees that there will be some transition in four years, if not before then. Not before. Yep. So that's a, that's a cluster of, of things we can hit. Um, and Stephen, can you help us with that uh, cornerstone intro? Or what can I do to help? Uh, I don't know that when I last spoke to Ambry and they're they're really looking for clients, not uh, their philanthropy starts at home. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to figure out if we can how we can finesse that. I think <clears throat> I think your push to more institutions um, will help. So it's something it's a conversation okay. with Ambry. Maybe we could have them come to one of those sessions. That's their that's their crowd. Mm -hmm. yep. Any it might anything? be better for the CIO. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The uh, principles of that. Yeah, that's that's coming together nicely. Um, but we'll, we're already planning ahead for the 12th. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the Tuesday. Yeah, I know since you're Mr. Tuesday. I'm sort of making it easier for you on the 15th. So I think we'll end up, uh, you'll kick it off in a way. Uh, I'll explain how we're, mm -hmm. 11 a.m. will kick off the global conference. Okay. It'll be shorter and sweeter. So any, any other topics? You know, you mentioned the close to home, Mark, and, and I'd love for you to do, you're the perfect guy to do this podcast um, because to the people, the theme has been local. They think everything's going to be hyper local and looped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as a theme. So, yeah. again, if I have one thing, I I need to do is literally. Have you guys ever done a Zoom recording of yourself or a, or a screen? Yeah, yeah. So, if you have, I'm. But if you want someone to chaperone you, I'm here. If you have to click. Literally, it's this uh, this link. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and uh, we, you, know, you just pick a, pick a time. And, you, and you'll notice that I, yes, it's not a mistake. I do get up early. <laughs> um, you get up the same time as I do, Mark. I know. <laughs> you go to bed late and get up late. That's all. Um, so that's another another thing that, you, but you don't need to, you know, you can do it on your own and just send it. Uh, and literally, as I showed you, click 
click that folder, new, upload, you're done. So, Matthew Friedman. Yes, sir. What's happening in the manufacturing world in the Midwest? Uh -huh. So thanks guys, it's been a while since I've been on. Glad to have been able to pinch in. So other than a truck literally being completely stuck in the icy snow that has enveloped uh, Cleveland, Ohio today, uh, the answer is, is we are on full speed ahead. I've really never experienced a time in uh, manufacturing, particularly automotive, like we are still at today. We are running pretty much seven days a week. The, the biggest uh, challenge has been and continues to be finding all of the right resources. And added to that is the congestion that exists uh, in terms of getting material uh, you know, on the ocean and through ports and, and supply chains have just elongated by upwards of four to six weeks. So, so one of the themes we're talking about at 1130 is education. How are you doing in terms of, of workforce education? And I know you you have Jobs Ohio and all the rest there. So it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, so uh, through uh, uh, Joe Jerbeck, who's also uh, on this call from time to time, he introduced me to uh, the woman in charge of uh, Skills, uh, Skills USA Ohio, uh, which is a program that takes kids who realize that maybe college is not for them and they want to go in a more vocational path. Uh, and they do a number of uh, uh, training programs throughout Ohio, and they actually have competitions. So my first foray into that was to be on the manufacturing panel, and I was reading that's right fine. before. That's I fine. Duncan. Yep. No. Yep. Great. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Duncan, you're on. You're not on mute. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I'm off now. <laughs> Okay, so in any event, uh, basically looking for all avenues to try and get our name out there, not just in Ohio, but elsewhere so that we can tap into, uh, you know, prospective employees at a much younger age, offer to provide some training assistance, develop them. I just actually approved of a, a, a younger employee who wants to develop her skills on the more data analytical side. So we've offered to reimburse a portion of her education, you know, that comes with guarantee. Right. Don't forget about Denison students. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Um, well, listen, uh, that, stick around and you can listen. You can see what, what they're doing on the education side or, or all these things are being recorded. So uh, uh, including this one. So um, some people just joined that, you know, we just had our co-leader meeting and the result of which we are gonna have a future of Europe event. Um, uh, and anybody could still speak up if, if, you know, we've been looking at doing something about the Biden administration implications, maybe mixed with a, a U.S. Uh, Senate focus that might uh, happen in our principal's CIO session. But any of the, we're, we're a, uh, the clay is always soft here. So if people want to come and mold it, but, you know, let, let us know. I know, Nazuba, you're active on the Africa thing. Uh, one theme came out is maybe we don't emphasize Africa and India as much or do something close to home that I asked what's what's that um, and for someone brought up Europe but um, in any event I think we'll, we'll find that balance and uh, what I'm excited about and I'm just going to as you will education we're going to come on to that in, in spades here um, particularly when we segue over to, to you Stephen kick it off but we have a, other events the, the virus on Thursday um, with, with the Novartis, uh, you know, in a hedge fund and the VC, and then the future of work by that afternoon. Next week, uh, publicist, uh, ex chief strategy officer. And then, then on the 15th, and I'm looking here, but my camera's here, but the 15th is a really exciting event where we talk about the, you know, the future predictions uh, and also, you know, the philanthropic side of us, our goals. And we're doing this in the form of a podcast series. And actually, speaking of which, Joan, I need to talk to you. Um, I've got everybody sort of, I got tons of these things happening and I got to figure out how to manage it on. That's what you do. Uh, yeah. So the other, um, so it's been really exciting. Again, you don't need uh, me to interview you. You can click uh, the link to schedule a Zoom or um, it's a little different than what Joe and I do when we just sort of catch up because it's sort of like just interviewing you so that you tell us um, your reflections and predictions. And again, you can just click on the, you can upload it to the Google folder 
And uh, also there's a survey, which I'll jump ahead to. I like the survey, uh, where was it, where'd it go? Well, I had a slide on survey, but uh, you, you, it led to uh, Esther providing hers and then she it almost gives you a script so that you can do the video portion, um, which she's done and, and Simon and some others already. So, you know, the, this is not for this crowd per se. Yeah, here's the survey slide. So it's 2021, that's an easy way to get uh, into the rhythm. You can stop there or then go to the video or, or just do the video. But I, I think the way Esther did it was great. Um, I think I'm going to flip on through most of the people, you know, you know, we're going to emphasize STGs more and more going forward. Um, Simon Vine said we should be focusing on people in transition like him, sort of former execs. So we're sort of thinking through what, what that means. And then a lot of thought leaders want to come because, uh, so we're going to try to figure out a way to, oh, but the emphasis is Big emphasis is on SPIFES, uh, Sovereign Wealth Pension Insurance Foundations, endowments, and they'll have their own events. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to you, uh, Stephen, although I think you uh, are going to take your own screen. Yep. So I won't stop sharing. Okay. Uh, thanks for uh, having me back. I hope Sean did. I know Sean did a great job while I was uh, away, but um, today it's about the politics and economics of education. <clears throat> and for all the progress we've made in society the last hundred years, one area that's been slower to develop has been the nurturing of our children, quite frankly. I think the, as Jack Maud recently said, <clears throat> excuse me, if we don't change the approach to the way we teach 30 years from now, we're gonna be in trouble. And I think he's right. I think we need a fresh approach to education. I'm looking forward to this session following uh, because I think they're coming with some, some new ideas, but um, we may get some from the Biden administration depending on how uh, the Senate plays out as we were talking about earlier. Um, but with um, Jill Biden, uh, first lady elect being a former high school and community college teacher, it's obviously a big area of emphasis. But in our view, um, we need to shift the focus from using standardized testing as the basis for evaluating success for preparing students for a life to, um, to preparing students for a life of continuous learning. We have to move away from the testing. The skills and things move faster than the uh, standardized tests allow. So let's just get into it. I think there are three things we want to cover, the challenge for policymakers, the Biden agenda, and some of the economics of education. So I think there's three big issues that are at play here. Um, the aging of baby boomers that I've talked about uh, a lot this year, technological advances, which we've talked about almost on every call, and then this globalization shifts, which are um, changing economic activity and changing roles. And what Matthew Friedman was describing just a few minutes ago with the uh, bottlenecks and getting parts and supplies back to Ohio is part of this uh, uh, onshoring that Nancy Lazard talked about, but we're going through some pretty dramatic changes in the uh, complexity and resiliency of supply chains. All this gets into the educational needs that we have. So I think the implications are, are clear. It's going to be tougher for growth when you have these kind of trends. Um, it's it makes a, a greater need for education with the technological advances. I think the number is something like six in 10 jobs require today require education beyond high school. I think that's gonna change considerably, <clears throat> but it's still something we need to keep an, an eye on. And we are seeing massive changes in the structure of the economy due to globalization, but also the pandemic. I think the biggest challenge in the US is the way we finance education. In most states, it's done through uh, paying for property taxes, um, which creates real inequalities based on uh, the wealthy areas do better than the poorer areas. And that's part of the Biden agenda to change. But we also know that state and local finances in the US are a real mess. Uh, I touched on that a couple calls ago. It's not getting better anytime soon. So where's the money gonna come from, I think is the biggest issue we're gonna be facing. But I wanna go back a little bit to post-World War II because there was a major push for broader participation in high school and college following the war. 
Um, by 1966, things like the GI Bill really paid off. And we started to see much greater participation in the workforce uh, for high completed high school and a move to uh, improve college education. But then from more recently, and I, I only pulled 2006 numbers, more than 90% of the labor force in 2006 had completed high school by about 20% had at least a bachelor's degree, but the big move came in the 70s and 80s. And since then we haven't had the same kind of success. But in doing the research here, I came off across a statistic that really set me back. And that is for each high school dropout, the cost to the economy is approximately $266,000 over his or her lifetime. They're paying lower taxes, more reliance on this on the government, higher rates of criminal activity, and a greater reliance of welfare. So it's not just about improving the quality of life for those individuals. This affects everybody when you're when you're a taxpayer or living in uh, the United States. So there are big challenges for the policymakers. So let's jump to the Biden agenda quickly. Um, he has five big areas he's outlined. He has three different reports that he's done to, to lay it out. Um, the first is supporting educators by giving them pay and dignity they deserve. They want pay equal to their degrees, provide some level of loan forgiveness for student debt, and also provide support for uh, teachers to uh, get uh, part of their education paid for when they're going into high demand areas such as special ed and bilingual education. And special ed is a big area for our firm at ARS. Uh, we manage uh, special needs trusts for uh, families all over, the, all over the country, but with a high emphasis in the US and it's gonna be even a bigger area for us going forward. Um, this is an area that from an investment perspective has been poorly served by uh, by most of the big Wall Street firms, um, but is a big area of emphasis. But it, it really gets to uh, their elements in, in schools is a big area that we have to focus on. Um, investing in resources for students and allowing them to grow into uh, uh, physically and emotionally healthy adults really goes to the fact that <clears throat> one in five students in the US experience mental health problems. The current ratio of school psychologists to students is 1400 to one. It should be about 700 to one or less, according to many experts. So that's a big issue for us. Um, it creates disruptions in classes and uh, it's requirement that we do better in that area. We have too many people in need. Um, it also gets to after school help, also weekends and summer childcare. Um, just, I know Sean talked about the American Society of Civil Engineers report. Our school safety is a big issue. We have a shortfall of uh, about 46 billion a year in school safety um, from the Society of Civil Engineers. So that's a big area that we need. And I think I mentioned this, but six out of 10 jobs require an education beyond high school. So um, today, so we have a lot of work to do in that area. Um, I mentioned the fact that a lot of the funding for uh, schools is done by property taxes, which creates a big inequality. Uh, to that end, the Biden administration is going to look to provide some federal funding to help support those uh, poorer areas. Um, so that's a big area of emphasis. Um, Matt was talking about what Jobs Ohio is doing in terms of apprenticeship programs and the like, but how do you get to a successful career and do our school curriculums, provide the skills that are necessary to grow uh, and to be successful longer term? <clears throat> and then more preschool stuff, um, both childcare and, uh, and also uh, preschool learning for three and four year olds is a big area of emphasis for the Biden agenda. I think the big issue is how do you pay for all this and how do you get it approved? And that a lot will depend on the uh, outcome of the Senate race as we touched on before. I think you'll probably see an under a GOP Senate, um, uh, some forgiveness of student loans, probably $10,000. I think the average student loan is about 30 some odd thousand, so that would be helpful. I think you'll see bipartisan work on some type of apprenticeship programs, which is an area I think the UK does quite well and we could pick, uh, pick up some things from there. I think there'll be a greater emphasis on community college. And um, I saw a statistic in the research here that community college graduates can earn 25 to 15, uh, 15 to $25,000 more a year 
than non-community college graduates. So that associate's degree at a very low cost level with big returns for people is a, is a way to go. And if they go on to a four-year college, they end up getting the same uh, type of earning capabilities as people who have graduated, whether you went four years at one school or two years in associate's degree and then graduated. So I think there's a lot they can do. It's a question of what they're going to do. Um, I think if uh, you have a uh, narrow democratic sweep, you'll see a lot more funding for the historically black colleges and public schools than you would have in a split uh, administration. So I think that's the rough outline as we see the agenda uh, for the uh, Biden-Harris education. I wanna just touch on the uh, economics of education and also some of the social aspects. So, <clears throat> you know, Ben Bernanke was a teacher. He's a professor at Princeton and um, really focuses on a lot of the Fed people have focused on uh, the importance of education and as a source for helping growth and making growth sustainable and reducing inequality. The other thing he pointed out in this speech in 07, which was a fascinating speech, was um, the more highly educated people are just happier. They make better personal uh, financial decisions. They are less uh, prone to long-term unemployment and they enjoy much better health. So it's not just the uh, economics, it's the social aspects that we have to focus on. So educational attainment by uh, and unemployment is a big deal. And I, I think if you just look at these charts, I've showed this one before, you look at master's degree, bachelor's degree, associate's degree, some college and less high school, but um, you can see there's big issues in terms of the divergence in rates. This gets even more pronounced when you get into the Native American and uh, Alaskan natives. Um, they are in a much worse spot for that. That's a whole nother area that we need to focus on as a nation. When you get into educational attainment and income, this is median weekly earnings and you can see the big divergences that come. It's something that I think needs to be focused on more and we need to do more to work through this and making uh, college more affordable uh, is something that's going to be critical to that and more accessible. I think one of the big opportunities, and I've talked about this a lot, is this low interest rate environment that we're in. And if we don't use, take advantage of it to invest in some of the things we need to invest in our future, the bill that's gonna be much bigger when it comes in later on. So very important element. I touched on this before, but the skills that are required to be successful are gonna be changing. And I think we have to look at active learning strategies, continuing learning, critical analysis and thinking. These are all things that are gonna be very important. And one of the things that I think is gonna be a very interesting dynamic and is the shift between or the, or the breakup between the STEM students and the more creative students and how companies bring them together to get success in both the, uh, the technical side as well as the creative side and how that's gonna work going forward and how companies can manage the very different personalities that often come with those different groups. At ARS, we think there are six critical transformations occurring right now. We wrote about this in our most recent outlook, the monetary and fiscal one, the geopolitical one, the digital one, the social and societal one, the climate one, and education, certainly a big part. We're doing a call next week on this um, to talk about these areas, but we've had a big focus on uh, the educational elements because it's so critical to our future. Uh, but I think these are all interrelated and as I mentioned, just the monetary and fiscal policy are helping provide the uh, opportunity to fund and make some of these shifts, but everything comes to the price tag and how we allocate the resources is gonna be critical. So with that, Mark, I'll stop and uh, I look forward to hearing the comments from the uh, group. No comments from the group, questions? What's so Stephen, I heard taxes, taxes, taxes. Um, and so, uh, um, and also it was interesting to hear your comment about a flattening of the uh, education school funding, which basically if you live in a wealthy town that has very high property taxes, it funds a very uh, expensive public school. Um, it sounds like they're going to be the losers uh, because there's going to be a redistribution of that wealth. So. Can you kind of fill in the blanks of that? 
I, I don't think the uh, wealthy areas are going to get hurt as much other than just general taxes going up. Um, I don't think it affects their schools as much. Um, in fact, they're probably earning higher property taxes in the suburbs now because of the uh, shift in the movement and the higher house sales. <clears throat> but I do think you'll see more federal funding for the less affluent areas to help um, level off the gap in the uh, school funding. So I think you'll see, and, and there's a, I think it's Title I or something, maybe the group coming up can speak to that better. But maybe there's a time to relook at how we do it and look at how other countries charge for school education and maybe you lower property taxes and do more on the state level where it gets allocated out differently to level it off. Um, but you're right, there may be a leveling um, that pulls the best down and brings the worst up, but that's really, that's the people we put in office and the decisions they're gonna make. But uh, I think it's, you're on you're onto something there. And I also, I wanna bring into the mix the situation in California where because of Prop 13, the funding of education is a whole different mechanism. And so I think that that's uh, another issue to talk about at some point. I mean, all these are worthy of their own deep dives, but when you talk about funding schools, it's not, the majority of funding in California is not by local property tax. And in Ohio, um, I put a comment in the chat. It is actually the high wealth districts have caps and there is a fair funding plan kind of being looked at right now. So with regards to school funding, the federal funding makes up a small percentage of what um, schools are funded. So local is very difficult to get a holistic perspective because each state has local control with regards to their funding. So I think that personally, the redistribution of the wealth in the high income districts should be going to lower income districts. And, and that moves you towards equity, you know, towards a, a full liberation in education. Um, but school funding is, <laughs> A huge beast that has been attempted to be in, to be tamed for for decades, and I think it's taking small bites of that apple. Um, so, if anybody does have insights on school funding, we are working on bills in Ohio. I'd welcome any conversations um, or best practice or idea. Stephen, the other thing is, I look at the the U.S. debt today, and it tops twenty seven uh, trillion dollars, mm -hmm. and and. Under a uh, Biden administration, which is arguably going to be less less uh, business friendly than what the Trump administration has been, um, I don't know if you guys have taken pen to paper and kind of thought through what a federal debt looks like at the end of the next four years, uh, and, and, and what, those, what those implications are relative to you know, GDP and, and, and world standings and those types of things. It's, it's too soon, Jim, to, to know. I, I, I will say I'm, I'm quite encouraged if uh, Janet Yellen becomes the uh, Treasury Secretary as how you marry the Fed's actions with fiscal policy to get a better outcome as opposed to having them work against each other. Because I think some of the part of the time we were, um, uh, the Fed was doing, providing the access, but then we couldn't get the money out into the system well enough to get the return on it, which led you to having higher debt loads with lower growth or not, not the equivalent growth that should come with it. So it really comes down to where does the money get put, Jim, when, you're, when you have the debt increasing and can we allocate efficiently? And, you know, the history is not great for that. Um, but it's going to be, it's late rates are going to have to stay low for a lot longer than people are expecting, even what the Fed has already announced till the end of 2023. I think you're looking at 2025 or even longer. I mean, Stephen, aren't they just going to borrow the money? I mean, they'll never pass the taxes. It's money costs 1%, half a percent. It's essentially free. So, yeah. and the, the market's already telling you that the dollar is weakening. All these cryptocurrencies are going. Yep. And Janet Yellen's basically, you know, the Fed was already talking about this issue of um, monetary policy had a way of basically creating this uh, K recovery outcome. So she switches sides. She goes over the, you know, to the administration side, and the the tool that she's going to have that she didn't have before 
is it's let's just borrow some more money. And it's in it's either borrow money or raise taxes. And with a split government, they're gonna have a tough time with the taxes. So I, it just seems pretty clear which way this thing will go. I do think some, ta I think taxes will go up, but not as much as the Biden administration uh, proposed originally, but it's not gonna go up as much as debt. So you're right there and you should lead to a weaker dollar, but it's gonna, it's gonna force rates to remain low for a long time. But keep in mind, our rates are a lot higher than most of the developed world even today. So yeah. on a relative basis, it's still attractive, which allows you to fund. Yeah. But um, it just seems to me like you think of what are the thing, the arguments, the easy wins, right? I mean, the easy win is borrow more money, don't tax more. The easy win is don't tell the person that's moved to the Greenwich School District on purpose that he's going to get screwed over. Just have the federal government fund the guys that don't have as good a system. I mean, you know, you don't create as many obstacles if you go with that route. That was, I guess, the point I was sort of making. Without question, Congress usually follows the path of least resistance. Um, but it, it will be interesting to see. I, I know on previous calls, people have said that the Biden administration won't be able to work with the Republicans. I'm not so sure that's going to be the case. Um, I think they'll work more towards the middle and get some stuff done, but it won't be as extreme as been proposed. And I think it'll be more certain in what we do going forward, which will actually have a, another effect on rates. If you have more predictable fiscal and monetary policy, you'll have more certainty, which allows people to operate and make better investment decisions. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, but I still think we have an allocation problem giving Congress the ability to appropriate funds. I think uh, it was... Uh, uh, Dave Barry said, giving Congress the ability to appropriate funds is like giving whiskey and car keys to teenage boys. And I think that's probably still the case. So we're gonna have to see what they do with the money that they're getting. And uh, how education gets put to the front or the back is gonna be a big issue, I think, for how we move forward in this area. Other comments, questions? Eddie Vonderpart, I know you you like education. Uh, how do you any comments on the education system? Putting on the spot. Let's let's discuss it when we have the session in uh, you okay. know in the the deep dive when it starts in four minutes. Any anyone else? Yeah, I'll jump in and say I love the discussion around combining STEM and creative development skills. And that might be a really interesting topic to expand upon in the future. There's also a lot of interesting sort of grounds up community nature education opportunities with children that allow them to be outdoors in a learning capacity. So that would fall into another type of bucket for the future. Mark, I would just add, I'm curious from the group coming up, their thoughts on the role of community colleges um, going forward, because I believe it could be expanded to really help deal with the financial problems and the um, and just the, the educational attainment levels uh, rise considerably if more people viewed the community college access as a more important part of our educational system. So I, I think, think that's another element. I think that's a great question. I think you'll get a chance to hear from Steve Dakin, uh, who's uh, going to be talking with respect to that exact area. Great. Hey, hey Mark, it's Rob. I had a quick question for Steve um, sure. that's non-education. Steve, um, some of the briefings from the healthcare companies on the vaccine, it seems a little um, either premature or um, a little bit inconsistent. Um, do you have, you've got pretty, pretty good insight to this stuff. Um, it's pretty dangerous for them to, you know, to share things that I think I saw something, whether it was either policy driven or from the health company of, of a certain amount of um, vaccinations in the U.S. by June. What are your thoughts mm. there? Uh, I have to say there, there are better people to talk about this than, than I. I think by June, we'll be starting to get comfortable 
with the vaccination process. And I think when first responders are, uh, or emergency workers are, are getting vaccinated and going through the process and you're starting to go, then they're gonna to go to nursing homes. I think next is what the proposals are. Um, I think it's gonna take a while to get ramped up and it's gonna take a while for people to get on board with it. I think confidence is going to be an issue, but I think once people start, the, once, the, once the ball starts rolling, people are going to be more confident in, in what, what's going on. I think the testing windows were much shorter than normal, which hurts confidence, but I think um, this disease is a bad one. I think people are going to say, do I want to take a couple of days of not feeling well or get, get on board with, uh, with um, getting vaccinated? And I think there'll be risks as we go through, but I think this is gonna be an important one to focus on. I don't think we're gonna be back to normal till the second half of next year. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Rob, but I, I think it's gonna be a sketchy kind of thing for the next, uh, certainly the next quarter. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the CDC is, is meeting today uh, to talk about priorities for vaccination. So, uh, you know, stay tuned for any, any results, you know, coming out. Uh, from from that meeting today. Yeah, I, I would just say, Rob, we're going to cover that topic on Thursday morning. Um, we have Novartis on, and and you got a hedge fund with tons of data, the VC perspective again. So we'll hit that. And Glenn Grossman, who is one of the speakers, is tremendous in this area and can answer the question correctly as opposed to the way I did. So. Uh, Forget what I just said, Rob, and wait till Thursday. <laughs> hey, Steve, I, this is Tom. I, I have a question. I mean, the funding of education, isn't it? It's also really exacerbated by the reduction of state revenues. I mean, I think state revenues, like almost 40% of their revenues, I think, go towards, you know, education, funding education in the state level, right? Yep. So, I, I mean... I, I just don't know how we're going to either borrow or tax our way out of this. I just, there's just not enough money to go around. Well, there's definitely not enough money for all the things that everyone wants. Um, right. So it's going to be a question of the states are in a real problem. We're going to have to bail up the states. If we bail out some of the states, we're going to be able to help solve part of that problem. But um, it's a real issue and, uh, and it's going to trickle down and not everyone can get fed the way they want to get fed in this process. So it's, you know, we're going to have real hard decisions coming. So I think we're going to hit these issues uh, but I think what the purpose of this next hour is to sort of, as you say, the you know the start at the very beginning, um, and, you know, level set everybody on on you know how the cards are are on the table with education, and then we'll come back to your question, Tom. Um, okay. So, as you know, uh, we've been putting these things together that you know people are very interested in certain issues, and they can champion them, and they team up, and so. Sarah and Leslie and Chris have teamed up uh, here uh, to put a panel together. And even we have a, a late edition being added uh, back. Um, I have, uh, which is Lisa Coleman, who I, 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 I don't have her picture up, but I have her, her video up, uh, if she remembers. This is in Abu Dhabi, Sydney, Accra. So we'll hit that in a second. Um, but it's a great uh, program you put together, Sarah and, and Leslie and Chris, and thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody. Um, so, you know, that I'm going to turn it over to, to the moderator, Sarah, um, to set the stage. And we'll, uh, it looks like many, most of the other speakers are here. So, uh, is, is Amit on? I just wanted to check yeah, one. Yeah, I saw Amit on. Okay. Hi. Amit, our friend in London who's investing in ed the education space and going to set that landscape up. And then, this, as, uh, as with others, this will catalyze. Right, a deeper dive on the investment side and a deeper dive in some of the other areas. So thank you, Sarah, take it over. Okay, and I just wanna to reiterate to what you said, Mark, that this is the first of many on education. As Steve brought up, there are so many aspects of education um, that warrant their own deep dives. So first of all, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank and recognize Leslie and uh, Chris who were instrumental in 
not only helping me put this together, but also getting speakers. And both of them also have enough information in education to warrant a discussion just focused on them and their areas of expertise. Um, just to lay the groundwork a little bit, uh, we do have a number of speakers. This particular education deep dive, some of you have heard me um, get on my little rant about how everybody has an opinion on education because we all went to school. So we all are our own experts in education. And it was important to me to make sure that the initial kickoff to any discussion of education sets a groundwork to understand the spectrum and continuum of education. And so with that, um, today we are going from the range of early childhood ed to post-grad. And we also are going to have some overviews about uh, equity, inclusion, diversity by Lisa, which covers all the areas. And we'll be ending with Amit, who will be talking about investments, specific investments in education. And like I said, each area warrants their own deep dive, and we'll get to that. As we move forward, I want to just share with you four of the driving questions that we posed to all of our speakers. Um, one, we asked, what are the current uh, changes and trends in your sector? Two, what are the main challenges inclusive of the current COVID situation? Three, what specifically needs to be done to overcome the challenges? And four, how can people businesses, organizations contribute in positive ways with opportunities, investments, and action. Each speaker is going to have about five or six minutes. We'll run through the speakers and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And if you have a question as the speaker is talking, you may want to just put it in the chat and we'll pick up those questions um, when we get to our question and answer session. And what I'd like to do is also let you know that um, thanks to some of the recommendations of others at 361, at the end of our discussion, I put a I will have a slide of resources for parents and families with respect to what resources exist during these times with the COVID situation. And it's a sampling of resources and I invite you to take a look at that. And I thank Charles and Mark for making that suggestion of putting that up. So to begin things, um, you're going to hear actually from me. So <laughs> what I want to do is just, Mark, can I have the slide deck for a little bit? Sure. You're, you're going to take control? Just of my slides. OK, so I'll stop sharing. Great. Oh, wait, so I've got to share, right? Let me do this. I can do this. Share share. Can you guys see it? Yep. Okay. So what I want to do is as we kick this off, I want to just give a little background um, and talk about one of my areas because it affects everything. And what I want to do is let you know that my background is that of a researcher. And uh, I work at the doctoral level working with students in education leadership. And I researched and write, as you can see in this book, issues around resilience. Never did I anticipate that we would be in a global pandemic. And so I have been very involved in this arena, especially now with respect to resilience, trauma, well-being of teachers and, uh, um, and students and parents. So 
I wanted to share that the Resilience 101, no, no deep dive, no heavy on the theory, just a real quick, what does resilience mean? And in the simplest terms, it is about um, bouncing back from adversity. And it's, again, like I said, never did I think that I'd be dealing with this on such a scale as we are today with the pandemic. I want to frame the discussion, something I want to talk about. People will often say that when um, I speak, it may be through rose-colored glasses. And I want to just share that that is absolutely not the case. I speak from a strengths-based perspective, which is very different than a deficit-based perspective. Instead of seeing a glass half empty, I see it full. Um, half full. And what that implies is it takes how we look at issues and how we frame issues very, very seriously, because instead of looking at what are the problems and how do we fix them, a reframing says, what are our goals, dreams, and aspirations? What does the best look like? And then what are our challenges to get there? So in essence, it's addressing the same issues, but instead of just doing an intervention, you're working to thrive. And again, this is what my research is about. I spend hours, days, workshops talking about this. The research in resilience did just that. It reframes the question instead of, the usual trauma-based way of looking at things and saying there is a risk that our, a child or a student or an individual is involved in. There's a risk, oh my goodness, what's going to be the negative outcome? Resilience reframed and said, why do individuals who are exposed to high risk make it? So they reframed it and looked at the protective factors of what supports people making it and adapting. So this basically gives the overview of what resilience research is all about. It gives people an insight and you will find this to be incredibly applicable in today's discussion as we talk about education across the sectors. The last thing I just want to say throughout education as with all our um, issues usually that we're talking about today, we are talking about how it involves systemic change. Having said that, I just want to remind everyone who makes up the systems, that for actual change to happen with the systems, it means those within the systems creating and implementing the systems themselves need to change sometimes how we frame things and how we move forward. So having said that, I'm going to leave my screen. Mark, I'm gonna give it back to you, okay? Sure. Okay, so um, Mark has the screen. Are we Stop next here. one, Alejandra? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, here's what we have. Um, Al I, is Alejandra on? She is. Yes, yeah, she is. Okay, um, this is what I'd like to do. I know that Lisa Coleman has a tight schedule. If Lisa... Alejandro, are you okay if Lisa goes or are your, is your schedule just as tight? Um, I do. I, I have another community conference. Okay. So let's. And, and I can go after her. It's totally okay. fine. I, I, have to, I have a hard stop later, okay. but I can go after her. Or, okay. Or second one. Yeah. Lisa, I know, and I hate to 
just jump, you push you right in there, but I am going to, I'm going to do just that. So Lisa comes to us um, from New York University. She's the senior vice president. Oh, you do want me to go first. Sorry. I thought yeah. you wanted Alejandra to go. <laughs> no, no. Um, and so Lisa is the senior vice president uh, working with global inclusion and strategic innovation at NYU. And I think Lisa, uh, another a good reason to have you go first is your area is applicable to all areas. So it gives also another opportunity to frame and set the stage. So without further ado, and then Alejandra, I'll have you go next. I'll introduce you. And as I said, if anybody has questions, put them in the chat room and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Thanks, Lisa. Of course. Thanks so much, sir. So hello, everyone. Hi, Mark. How are you? It's great to see you as usual. Yeah. Um, so hello, everyone. As, uh, as she said, I'm this, uh, I have this role as senior vice president at NYU. And so I work um, across our global sites. And I'll just say for those of you who, um, if you're familiar with NYU, we have sites in Shanghai and Abu Dhabi. Those are our portal campuses. So you can actually go to school at NYU and never come to New York, to, to New York. Um, and then we have 13 sites all across the world. We have sites in Australia. Uh, we have six or seven, I never remember, in Europe. And then we have sites in places like Ghana. Um, we have res and, then, and then we have research centers in places like Dublin, uh, Athens, South Africa. And so there are about 25 of those that are, um, that are significant, meaning substantial in terms of those efforts. And I work across all of those efforts up until about, um, I guess, uh, March, <laughs> I was on the road 70% of the time, and like many of you, and then, you know, everything we, shifted. We, we were supposed to see each other in China in 2018. Right. You had to be in Beijing or Shang, Shanghai, and you were, but you never showed up. I, didn't, <laughs> I was a little delayed, Mark. So that's right. That's right. So yeah. So um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, just try to talk about some of the things. And I'm actually going to piggyback on some of the things that Sarah just said. So and I heard, of course, Stephen's talk. So I'm not going to delve into all of the challenges across higher education because they're vast. And so if we think about cost, obviously, um, the return on investment in terms of parents and then students um, and particularly changing generations and their demands for what they want to see. And I always say, um, I never want to be canceled. So I pay attention to cancel culture pretty, um, pretty strongly because I work in that environment. So we have to think about that. But seriously, so really thinking about these new demands in new generations. Um, and the varying expectations. I think the challenges obviously in this remote space have been dramatic for a lot of institutions because many institutions quite frankly uh, weren't ready to be remote. And um, people have asked me a lot uh, do do places like NYU or where I used to work at Harvard, um, are they going to become totally remote? The answer is no. Um, and we can talk more about if you have questions about sort of what's happening in the higher, edu higher education landscape in terms of the hybridization of um, online remote learning and then sort of the brick and mortar. Um, but obviously those are challenges in terms of thinking about the space and, um, and where we are uh, currently within that space. I think the, um, the other challenges that we have obviously are when we think about higher education, um, sometimes higher education isn't exactly aligned with uh, business opportunities or if it's not business schools are different. I actually teach in our Stern School of Business. I teach MBAs. Um, but if you think about across right the landscape of higher education, we often have some alignment um, challenges. I would say the other places where we see some challenges, quite frankly, are um, in terms of the, the practice and pace of higher education. And um, we can come back to that, but the pace sometimes. And then lastly, what I'll say is we have something called tenure. So uh, transformation and changing higher education systems become challenging that space. I've already talked about digitization. And now what I wanna really talk about is my area is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So over the last few months, we've seen significant challenges. Whether that, if you're reading the article about the depression of women in terms of research 
um, and employment opportunities, if you're thinking about people with disabilities, if you're thinking about uh, people of Asian and Pacific Islander descent, we saw xenophobia and increased xenophobia directed toward those communities at the beginning of the pandemic, and obviously recently with people of African descent and the global protests uh, that we saw, consecutive protests across the globe for 45 consecutive days. So there are challenges there, but I also want to go back to what uh, something that Sarah said earlier, how we frame something. I think is what we get. So uh, many people have been framing these uh, emerging uh, challenges, emerging things as challenges, and I like to frame them as opportunities. And so I think that if we think about what's been happening with gender issues, it gives us an opportunity to think about the reframing of our workplaces in terms of things like childcare, elder care, um, the kinds of spaces, and what we know with new generations. So the emerging generations, millennials, Generation Z, and of course those 10 year old alphas. Um, they want a different kind of workspace. The kinds of workspaces that they want are much more attentive to these issues of thinking about climate, uh, thinking about culture, thinking about practice, and also peer advancement. And so, um, so as we're thinking about the, um, the challenges, I always like to turn those into the opportunities. And if we think about the challenges also in terms of digitization, um, this is a time where we can also think about the opportunities in the digital spaces. And I think Steve uh, talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, what specifically needs to be done, and I'm gonna go quickly through this, a co-creation. I cannot say enough about this. So Steve brought up um, the idea of the, um, STEM and creative spaces. We have something at NYU called our maker space. We have uh, these very large buildings in Brooklyn and our 370J project, as well as our Institute of Public Knowledge. These are three new initiatives that we have created, which bring together faculty, students, and staff across the STEM areas and the four schools that are aligned in this area, our school, of, our business school, our school of engineering, our school of um, Tisch School of the Arts, which I would like to say is number one. Yes, I know uh, USC likes to compete with us, but, um, and then um, our School of Education and our Media and Technology Labs. We have literally created what we call a makerspace, bringing those four schools together. And then we are partnering with three community colleges and a teaching, uh, uh, teaching which is called our Metro Center, which teaches, um, which trains teachers across public schools across New York. That space is a space of co-creation. So when we think about what needs to be done is how are we creating these new spaces of co-creation, particularly engaging Gen Z and uh, disabilities. And then what kinds of investments are we making? And I think that the kinds of investments are exactly those kinds of investments that I just mentioned. Co-creation across right major universities, community colleges, and then this K through 12 uh, opportunities with higher education and um, and, uh, uh, and uh, K through 12 in higher education. If you think of uh, recently, the Wallace Foundation here in New York called together a, a bunch of leaders to actually think about what these new possibilities would look like, particularly as we uh, try to prepare younger generations and then think about the job markets and opportunities. And the last thing I'll say here is I think the uh, opportunities are vast, obviously, as people were talking about cryptocurrencies, but AI, um, robotics, et cetera, but particularly in these spaces of bringing diverse communities together. So um, one of the things that we've created is a new opportunity. We're doing hackathons, solvathons. Um, we're starting with people, is, as, as, as I said, in high school, and then pairing them with people in college. And then we're targeting uh, organizations that work with lower income organizations. We've partnered with places like the United Negro College Fund. We have something called our uh, Faculty Resource Network, which brings together 20 Hispanic and uh, uh, Hispanic women's and um, uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And then my next uh, opportunity is to actually expand to work with tribal colleges. And those of you who work, know the work with tribal colleges, really thinking about that educational system, which has been underserved um, tremendously. And um, if we think about the COVID-19, uh, indigenous people are 11 times more likely to contract uh, COVID-19 and four times more likely to die of COVID. Uh, people of African descent, of course, are three times more likely. So really thinking about those opportunities also in the healthcare spaces and we have our global healthcare, 
also our global health school, our medical school, and our nursing school. We've developed a new space for um, innovation and incubation with them as well, and really focusing on those communities that have been disproportionately and differentially impacted and uh, bringing Generation Z and the alphas to help us think about that work. So I will end there. I hope that helps frame out some of the issues and some of the work that we're trying to do both at NYU, but with our partners globally. I cannot thank you enough, Lisa. And I love um, the reinforcement of how to frame things with looking at them as opportunities. So I thank you for that. And as everybody can see, uh, we could just have two hours with each speaker on the panel. Unfortunately, it's five to six minutes. So I thank you, Lisa, for your you. breadth and wealth of information. Um, next, I want to introduce Alejandra, um, uh, who is Alejandra Bazzara, Dr. Alejandra Bazzara, who is uh, the president and of the High Scope Research and Education Foundation. And one of the things that is really important when we have a discussion on education is to include the sector early childhood education. And so with that, I'm going to pass the talking stick to Dr. Barraza and thank you for being, and being here on our panel. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Lisa, and I hope I can connect some of uh, my work from early childhood and high scope with what uh, you just mentioned, Lisa. Uh, Mark, are you, oh, perfect, thank you. My colleague um, is gonna do that, uh, Jace, at the moment. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll just thumbs up to, to go to the next. Thank you, this is helpful. Um, we are the High Scope Educational Research Foundation. A little bit about us, uh, our, our background. Could someone go to the next slide? Oh, thank you so much. We are a nonprofit foundation and we are celebrating our 50th anniversary and we are located in Ypsilanti, Michigan. We are the leaders and innovators in early childhood field. It was pioneered by the High Scope Perry Preschool Study which was started in 1962. It's the longest longitudinal study in, uh, in the world with early childhood. And um, Dr. Jack Heckman from the University of Chicago was able to do a follow-up work and received a Nobel Prize on his uh, summary about with the High School Perry Preschool that really taught us that when we invest $1 in early childhood, the return upon investment is nine dollars back to society so our really central piece of our curriculum is a plan to review where children actually um, plan they they think about what they're going to do they they actually follow through their ideas and then they reflect on their experience and how important to develop this in early in the early years because this is something that we use even as adults um, yes next I just wanted to share uh, within our High Scope Education Foundation, we do have partners uh, in um, some schools throughout the country, these in particular and in San Antonio in an underserved area. These are Head Start schools within the public school system. So the importance of, um, of really partnering with different entities. Um, yes, if you wanna go ahead. Um, and this is one of, High Scope really holds inclusive values and really speaking to what Lisa was saying that we, we are really in, interested in serving all children, making sure that we have families as partners and that we are culturally inclusive of all children. Next, thank you. And this is really our, our active, uh, the wheel of learning. Um, I just wanted to give everyone an overview before I answer the four questions that Sarah uh, commented. We, we focus on the learning environment, daily routine, adult interaction, assessment, the importance right now about assessment and about understanding um, the education system is really now pushing for standardization, but the negative effects and now with COVID and how important it's going to be that we really focus on socio-emotional aspects of the development of a child. And even, I know there's some business leaders along here with us. We really have to start wondering about the standardization 
because what is happening in our education system is that it's really taking out the creativity in our children. And so as we think, what are we, what do we really want to have at the, as an end when a child goes through the education system, we definitely want creativity. And at times that is not happening because of such a push on standardization. Thank you, next. These are just some pictures from the school. Um, I want to answer as um, Lisa, you know, the questions that were posed to us. What are some current challenges that we that we have? As you can see, um, I included pictures of children. These are current pictures, probably from last week, of some of our schools, our high scope, uh, San Antonio Hub of Excellence, um, and we can see that in the early years, it's very difficult to do online virtual learning. So we have had to open up our doors to our. Um, you know, to our children, of course, we've got three and four year olds wearing masks. But one of the challenges that we're facing is the trauma that not only the children, the families, but our teachers are facing right now. So how can we support teachers? Um, one of the trends that we're going to see in education is the use of technology. But of course, in the early years, that is very difficult. So how do we actually bring in uh, technology? Well, we can really create virtual classrooms where we could offer spaces where, for example, if children could, we are, we are creating this in some of our schools in San Antonio, where if a child is at home and they can't participate in the classroom, they can wear some virtual glasses and actually feel like they are within the space. Mm -hmm. So how can we actually provide um, tools for children that we can actually um, support them with the use of technology? Um, how could we contribute? How can the business world support and contribute? For example, in our case, um, HighScope is a nonprofit foundation. So we are a nonprofit research foundation that, are, that is really focused on thinking about the early childhood years, um, how we can, you know, how it can business can really invest in early childhood, whether it's in your local community. A lot of people think that, you know, because it's early childhood, that all the children do is play. And actually that is a very important piece of the development of the brain of the child. So how do we offer now after COVID spaces in schools and in classrooms where children will be able to go outside and play outside and have a lot of, um, they're gonna, the trauma informed practices that we're gonna have to come into our schools as we're thinking about the children who are gonna come back next year into our schools. Sarah, I don't wanna go over my time. I don't even know how much time I've taken, uh, but I know you've got a lot of guests. Um, so that this is a little bit about high school. I think we had one more slide with pictures of the kids, which is always. And I, I wanna thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barraza. I think that um, again, the area of early childhood ed is so important and um, again, warrants a deep dive of its own. And when we talk about education, I'm real cognizant of always including early childhood ed as a component. So I thank you so much for your participation and I know you have to go. So uh, thank you so much. And what I'm going to do is if there are questions specific to uh, questions for you, I can curate those and send them your way. So if people have questions and if you're not here for the Q&A, people can put them in the chat and I'll curate them and send them to you so you get a chance to answer them. Absolutely. Okay. Next, um, after early childhood, the next step is K-12. And for a representation for the K-12 sector, we have Rashawn Holloman. And Rashawn is the Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Government Relations for the Georgia Charter Schools Association. And one of the things I'm gonna say again is as with any sector, it is futile to be arguing with each other. We need to all work together. And so I think it's important for us all to have representation from charter schools, public schools, independent schools, and as I said, the spectrum. So Rashan, without further ado, take it away. 
Well, thank you, Sarah. You actually used a phrase and uh, relayed the groundwork how I have to lay the groundwork and here at the Capitol. I didn't stage this on purpose. I just happened to be having a meeting with our speaker pro team today in true form of the work that I do. Um, but, you know, thank you all for having me and look forward to uh, this discussion and, you know, very helpful information that's already been shared. Um, you know, as was mentioned, uh, the social and emotional learning of students is something that's very important and on the top of everyone's radar right now in education, especially K-12 education. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, the work that I do. I am a uh, governor, government affairs and advocacy uh, person at our organization, which is a nonprofit membership organization for all the charter schools across the state of Georgia. Uh, but prior to me being here, I served as a charter school teacher and a principal. I became a principal when I had hair at the right age of seven, uh, 27. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> that's good, moderate. That's good. You saw those slides. Um, and, you know, and prior to that, and Prior to be, uh, having this role, I worked at the Ohio Department of Education uh, in the Office of Community Schools, which charter schools are called community schools in Ohio, and led the charter school office there uh, before uh, coming back down here to Atlanta. And so uh, here I am at the uh, epicenter of the political world right now. I'm going to decide the fate of our country in many ways. And so uh, in a building that I'm sure many of you have seen on CNN and other news outlets uh, as of late. Uh, but, you know, speaking uh, from the K-12 perspective, you can go to the next slide. I'm just going to stay there. Um, this pandemic has really become much like an accelerant to a fire, and it has accelerated much of what we've been known as issues or areas that we've been working on in K-12 education uh, over the next uh, the past few years, uh, one being the equity gap. And, you know, I, I really enjoy this graphic of the uh, use of equality versus equity and you know I, I probably don't have to tell you all but you know resource allocation is so important when it comes to education and one thing that we have learned over the years is that while equality calls upon us to treat everyone the same and everyone equally we've learned that it's important for us to uh, be more uh, acknowledgeable of the fact that we need to equitably pass out and, and use our resources to make sure we're proportionately doing that based upon need uh, to get the same outcome. And so that graphic is a great illustration, illustration of that. While we want everyone to be able to ride a bike, not everyone may need to necessarily the same bike. And so making sure that we are getting resources to schools. Uh, for example, here in Atlanta, we have some elementary schools where the per pupil spending is about $12,000. And in the same exact district, uh, that per pupil spending is about 17000 And it's because of some of those underprivileged areas needing more resources and allocations, whether it be for facilities or support services to have wraparound services for families that are in need. And so that's one area where we've been really focused on in K-12 education. Uh, next, you know, as was mentioned earlier, social emotional learning is such an important uh, aspect of learning make sure that we're caring and educating the whole child and applying knowledge and attitudes and skills to understand uh, and manage emotions but ultimately setting and achieving goals and you know using empathy to enjoy to ensure that we're educating students in a safe and positive learning environment uh, social emotional learning uh, now and more than ever also encompasses having social workers and counselors in schools. In Georgia, we have uh, allocated funds towards that because we're recognizing the fact that it, it's important that we have school counselors that are not only you know, focused on academic uh, trajectory of students, uh, but also ensuring that their emotional needs are met, uh, and especially in some of our underserved communities. And so that's a, been a, a big area of attention that we've been given to schools. Uh, Next is connectivity. This pandemic uh, has shown us that we have a major issue with connectivity and broadband across uh, the country and not just in terms of while in education we are focused on one-to-one -one, uh, technology in our schools, we are realizing that there are a lot of kids do, that do not have connectivity. And you know, research is showing us uh, from NCS has, has said that about 14% of kids don't have access to uh, high quality internet. And you know, that may sound like a no, no, low number, but that is about 9 million kids across the country. So that is a, a huge amount of kids that uh, during this pandemic are 
struggling to even obtain their education. Uh, one you know, thing we like to point out is it's not just in rural areas, it's in uh, underprivileged areas as well. You know, we have kids here in Atlanta that have to go to a Taco Bell or to a, a McDonald's in order to receive their education while they're learning from home. Um, so that's been become a very big issue and one area where here in Atlanta, they were able to partner with foundations to be able to not only get uh, laptops into kids' homes, but to get hotspots into kids' homes. And so that's been a, a huge help, especially during this uh, process of at-home learning. Uh, you know, the greatest concern now, I think, in education is learning loss. Uh, you know, just today, NWEA put out a, a study that showed that you know, when you look at test scores, now mind you, this was about four million kids that they looked at, and so you know, during this pandemic, there are many kids that didn't have access to be able to be tested or were not physically tested, you know, in sight. And so there are a lot of kids that were not included in the study, but it's already shown that students between third and eighth grade are about five to ten points down in uh, their test scores from last year and so uh, the greatest concern now is reading uh, is, is learning loss amongst students and so it's really important that as we are beginning to you know get kids back in school and begin uh, to you know get out of this uh, pandemic you know how are we going to address the fact that many kids are now uh, behind where they would have been had they been in school because you know as Dr. Coleman mentioned many of these schools were not equipped uh, to be able to educate their students remotely and many students were not uh, well prepared uh, to be able to receive that education both both socially emotionally and just physically in terms of having access to what is necessary and having parents that are equipped to be able to handle that because it puts a, a certain burden on parents. I'm sure many of you on this call have experienced that burden, uh, but you know, especially for parents that are having to juggle the fact that they have to work and uh, cannot uh, get to uh, work because their, their kids are at home. And so that leads to another big area, uh, especially the area that I work in and that's school choice. We are seeing that in traditional schools, uh, especially here in the metro Atlanta area, for example, Atlanta Public Schools is down about 1,200 kids from last year. Uh, DeKalb County, which is a suburb of uh, Atlanta, is down 5,000 kids. Uh, that's a, a multiple, if you look at it, multiple nice sized high schools of students that are now not in traditional public schools. And so the question is, okay, where are the kids going? Uh, and, you know, that really highlights the, the need uh, for school choice. You know, I, obviously I work in the public charter school space, but, you know, there's, you know, traditional schools, you, you see students, uh, kids that are actually, you know, moving uh, to areas where they can get into a school during this pandemic because some parents, you know, have to work. They don't have a choice or there may be a public charter school that is open in a district where uh, the traditional uh, students are not being able to go into the school. And so therefore they're, they're sending their kids to uh, public charter schools. And so uh, this pandemic has really you know, shown us that there is a need for a choice, not just in a, uh, the sense of, okay, well, I want to be able to send my, uh, my child to a school that best fits them, but it's really that best fits the needs of the family and the circumstance by which we are living in. And so uh, we're experiencing that uh, right now with the uh, enrollment trends uh, within the traditional public school space. And, you know, just to give some perspective with charter schools, charter schools have grown about a million uh, students over the past five years. They went from about 2.5 to now about 3.3 million kids are educated in the charter schools across the state. Uh, and so, you know, to give a kind of a picture of what those kids look like, about 60 percent of kids that are in charter schools across the state are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And that's, of course, the indicator for um, economic uh, hardship. And uh, in terms of uh, the uh, racial makeup, it's about 30 percent uh, Hispanic, 30 percent black and a little less than 30 percent uh, white. So, you know, it's a really diverse group of kids that we're talking about. I think a lot of times there is a misperception uh, of what a charter school is and what that makeup looks like. Uh, but, you know, these are some of the areas that in, in, in the K-12 space that we're focusing on. Uh, the greatest challenge right now is to really find out where our kids are and that learning loss. Obviously, the pandemic has caused uh, schools 
to uh, have a reduced funding uh, here in Georgia. We are down about 9% uh, in state education funding uh, due to the uh, pandemic. And, and so now is uh, no time more than ever to have uh, investment in education uh, to help supplement some of that loss that we've had financially. And obviously, because we're going to have to have even more resources to address the learning loss that has occurred. You know, as Sarah mentioned, uh, you know, folks are resilient. Kids are some of the most resilient uh, folks in the world. Uh, but, you know, it takes resources to uh, help to educate kids, especially now post pandemic and, you know, the learning loss that's going to uh, happen as a result. Sean, thank you so very much. You touched upon so many important issues once again, and I hope people are really able to see how this whole continuum uh, works together instead of being siloed. And so next on that continuum, as we move forward, I want to introduce Steve Dakin, who is a member at large for the at, on the Ohio State Board of Education. And he is going to talk with us um, on the next step, talking about community college, workforce development, and adult ed. So Steve, um, all yours. Great, thanks, Sarah, and, and uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, who's joined the, the the call today, and appreciate my fellow panelists. I've learned that I've been taking copious notes here um, as I've uh, listened to the various panelists talking. Um, go ahead and advance the next slide, if you would, please. <clears throat> um, let's go to the next slide there. So. We talked a little bit about trends, and I'm going to go through these slides very, very quickly because I really do want to get to the Q&A. I think that's where uh, a lot of really good dialogue could happen. But I, I put this particular piece of information up because this the Strata Educational Network uh, uh, conducted a, a Consumer Insights public survey uh, around uh, some kind of, if you're looking at this from the perspective of educational attainment, kind of troubling data here, uh, where almost 52% of adults who were surveyed don't really believe a good job is within their reach or they can advance. 52% of the adults uh, who were surveyed, one in four Americans that don't have a college degree don't think that additional education training would make a significant difference. Um, and then Americans without college degrees say they have a stronger connection to work um, and more support and, help, and need more support and help navigating education and career. Um, that's significant as a trend. This is my argument here with this data is that we saw these trends before COVID. COVID has only accelerated the, this kind of disenfranchisement among, certain, among adults uh, in, in our country. Next slide, please. One second, there we go. And then some challenges. We heard it already about access to broadband. It's a huge challenge. We're seeing it in K-12. We see it in higher ed. Uh, at the community college, Columbus State, of which I serve as superintendent of school community partnerships, we serve over 40,000 students a year. And we have went to 90% to of our classes online that are, are now remote. And we did it in a very fast time in response. But what we found is, particularly students who are underrepresented, underserved in, in higher education, had access, had problems with access uh, to, to content. The issue of equity is, has been there. We, there's been some comments made already in the panel, so I don't need to go into that, but suffice to say that is a huge lens of which we, we view everything from at the college. Uh, we believe we look like as a college what our community looks like. And, and as such, we have a, I always say we put community in the phrase community college because we see this as more than just academic course preparation. Um, it's really going at issues of transportation, child care, food insecurity. Um, those are all parts of the system that we need to bring together. So the other piece, I think we skipped a slide. Um, there was some data up there on the previous slide, I think. Right there. Um, I think it's a, there's a, one that's got a table on it that's got um, statistics on it. Right there? Oh, I'm not, you know what, I'm not, I'm not sharing. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, there you go. So I want to show this because this is this is really sobering in Ohio. If we believe that educational attainment generally leads to greater economic prosperity for people, these kind of data are troubling. 
So we look at this and this is a trend. So I started with the class of senior uh, graduating class of 2016 in Ohio. We had about 137,000 students who were in the cohort that were eligible to graduate in four years in Ohio, but only 84% or 115,000 actually graduated from high school in that cohort. And then you see the other numbers, the number of students who actually entered college, which is pretty high, 53% entered. But then you go down and say likely to graduate within six years, it's a dismal 29%. Mm -hmm. So starting with that 137,000, we're down to 39,000 who after six years actually graduated from a, a college or a university in Ohio, which, which leaves a huge number of students who either entered post-secondary and dropped out within the first semester or never entered at all. So about 60 some percent of, and this is a trend that we see year over year in Ohio. Next slide, please. So I kind of look at this as the intersection of policy practice and investment. I spent 35 years in K-12, the last, the last several years as superintendent of a, of a, a district here in Franklin County. I came to higher ed six years ago in my current position. I'm mm -hmm. on the workforce development board of our region. So I kind of have the lens of workforce, higher ed, and K-12. And so these are some things I see that, that there are opportunities here because it really is the intersection. Policymakers and investors largely want to see some sort of ROI on their investments or their policy. Uh, and, but there's a, there's a lag with practice in many respects. So we may have good policy. And I argue in Ohio, we have pretty good policy in Ohio, particularly for uh, post-secondary. We have a program in Ohio called College Credit Plus that allows any student beginning grade seven uh, in high school, uh, in middle school through, through high school to take college coursework free of charge, free of textbooks, um, as long as they demonstrate eligibility and readiness to take that course. Um, so that's, that's a pretty good policy. Um, but these are some things that I would suggest that, that we would be interested in, in really taking a look at as we, as we go down the road. But I, I first thing is in post-secondary, every, every child in K-12 should have some sort of success plan that minimally is, com uh, uh, is comprised of career, academic, and financial planning. Those three components, every child should have a plan upon leaving, exiting high school. Right now in Ohio, we only require that of those students who are at risk of not graduating in four years. Students should leave, and I still say, all students should leave high school with an industry recognized credential or foundational dual enrollment credits that are translated into stackable opportunities moving forward after, after graduating from high school. And then frankly, states need to get their act together, um, get on my soapbox now, that need to adjust high school accountability standards and metrics but by moving away from its primary focus, which has been the last 20 years on traditional college preparation and embrace career readiness as a core goal. It's just it's, uh, really important for that. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm doing it, but I'm resuming share. Sorry, go ahead. So, um, you know, we've already talked about the access to, to the internet, but, but the other piece is, and I want to take a, just a moment to kind of elaborate on this. One of my responsibilities at the college is I oversee a thing called the Central Ohio Compact. It's, a, it's kind of a collective impact effort in our region that creates, it identifies a series of regional strategies getting at the big, bold regional goal of having 65% of our adults have a post-secondary credential value by 2025. The state has now kind of adopted that as a 65 to 25 goal. The issue at play here is that most states do not have infrastructure set up in their states, either at the regional level or at the local level, to make these connections between all these entities. The community college, in my humble opinion, is perfectly situated to do this. We, we lie in between our four-year university partners, our employers, our K-12, and increasingly our nonprofits and social services agencies. And so we are kind of the conduit. We played the role of convener facilitator of bringing people to the table in an annual set of summits to solve big problems in our region. And, and so these kind of collective impact structures, whether it's a cradle to career or a collective impact or maybe a P-16, councils, these are critical, in my opinion, to be the connective tissue 
to leverage a region's assets on behalf of a particular goal. And so I just want to kind of call that out specifically when we think about investments, we think about policy, we think about these kind of things, very few states have these in place that actually bring everybody to the table and focus on a big goal for that particular region. Um, and then I talked a little bit about um, in K-12, students and their families and counselors really need access to reliable and timely information about growing career fields and college programs that yield strong labor market return. That is, a, that is most K-12 districts are devoid of that information. They simply don't know. And so kids are left trying to figure things out when they don't have the relevant information. I'm sorry to do this to you, but just a couple more minutes because we got a, one more speaker then to your point. I'll just wrap it up real quick. Next slide. And so, so the, the, the last thing I would leave it with is that, um, and I talked about, we don't have data systems. Post-secondary and, and K-12 don't talk to each other with their data systems well. We don't talk to employers. Labor market data is not readily available. We need to think about these longitudinal data systems so that we understand where we are in real time uh, with respect to the, the needs of, uh, of the economy. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is that uh, we need to start in middle schools with this career exploration and career awareness. It's too late in high school. Um, if we wait to high school to do it, decisions are already being made. And so we really need to get this information down in the, in the middle grades as well as educating parents at the same time. Um, so I apologize for running through that very fast, um, but uh, um, looking forward to some Q&A later. Thank you. And, and, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, what I was going to say is I invite everybody to press the save the chat and uh, be able to have access to these slides so they can review and see them again later because once again everybody can um, take uh, two hours with the information it's also helpful and we can go on a deep dive with all of this i want to also let people know that the future of work panel that will be getting into a lot of these issues as well. So Steve, thank you so much for uh, being here. Hopefully we'll get to the Q&A. What I'd like to do is have Amit. Oh, go ahead, Mark, did you have something to say? Real quick, since I'm from a first to go to college uh, kid in Ohio, I went to a Newark High School and we only had 17%, not 53% in 1986. Go on to any post high school and then I think the the graduate so we've gotten better <laughs> but uh, at least uh, maybe not statewide but it's uh and I think that we're going to also have a big Ohio event coming up soon so I think it's nice to have it there's a lot of Ohio connectivity obviously so it's great uh Amit you also bring some global perspective too yes and I know Amit you have a lot of slides um I just want to make sure that we leave time for some Q&A at the end so I welcome uh take yeah. it away you Next might time. want to be a bit more wary of that a bit earlier Sarah go, but that's okay I've got more slides than time unfortunately you go uh, first let's through it you're first next time um yeah I mean essentially I think the core approach that I've taken here and I, I've been investing in education for about nine years now from a private equity perspective. And it's, it's a sector that's evolved significantly over time uh, to become much more of an investable asset class. I think from an American perspective, people tend to view education more as an investment sector from an education technology point of view. And the, the concept of private education or private school for profit in K-12 in particular or early years not really seen as a for-profit entity. That's a very different mindset to the rest of the planet, uh, particularly in the UK where private schooling in particular is a phenomenal component of the education system here, for good or for bad. Um, kind of looking at the, um, in terms of the core sectors and core segments and kind of looking at the slide deck, you know, the core education trends that we're seeing are you know, the impacts of Generation Z on, uh, on education, their expectations, the future of work, and it's generally international education. Um, moving on to slide three, the, uh, you're, you're already on it right now, this is perfect. Um, why education? 
I mean, to be honest, it's the main reason is that, I mean, the education sector generally is probably where healthcare investment was about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, in that you have a very defensive section, a very defensive sector. It's something where in terms of discretionary spending, you will spend your absolute last dollar on your health as, as, as much as you can afford it. That's generally the case with education as well, particularly when it comes to early years of K to 12. Um, and the second component I would say is typically when you go to an investment bank or a group, they will all have a healthcare coverage team, but they don't have an education team just yet. And I'd imagine that is going to change significantly. It's no longer going to be parked within consumer and leisure. Uh, it will have its own separate investment team over time as the sector matures and you get more investable companies. Core reason why you'd want to invest in the sector, I've kind of tried to lay it out as simply and distilled as possible on this slide, but generally you've got pretty high pricing power, you know, particularly seen during COVID recently, private schools, education in particular has done extremely well during this, during the last, you know, eight, nine months. Um, it's super counter cyclical. I've invested in businesses that have grown significantly during tough times, K to 12 schools in particular, um, private schools in particular, you see a lot more flights to those schools and defensiveness in terms of their profitability and fees. High barriers to entry, setting up schools, setting up tertiary institutions is difficult. Setting up an education technology business is difficult as well. It's not something you can just simply start up in a day. Uh, as I said, it's a slightly, slightly out of date stat here, but global spending on education is up 7% per annum. K-12 business globally is worth about $48 billion. Uh, ROI is, uh, is extremely high because more and more so you're moving towards the asset light model of with schools. You don't want to necessarily be in a property business with schools. Let someone else take care of that. You just focus on operations. And technology is the key to, to this. The days when EdTech is represented by a company like Blackboard, which is predominantly about learning management systems, has evolved significantly. Again, COVID's had a tremendous impact on this. It's really been a stress test on what are the major education technology companies out there, how well do they work, how quickly were schools able to switch to a hybrid model or to go fully online. The experience for the most part across the planet has been that most ed tech companies right now are crap and haven't really been able to support the kind of learning quality and learning outcomes that parents expected and schools expected when they signed up to these systems. So I would expect over the course of the next 24 months, there to be a significant development and acceleration in terms of quality of ed tech investments. It's too fragmented right now. There's a lot of crap out there and very little actual traction. And moving on to the next slide, in terms of the, the typical approaches that we've seen in the sector so far, and again, this is very generalized, it's quite different from different parts of the world, but I've tried to make it as, uh, as generalized as possible from a Western market point of view. The three core strategies that you've seen have been a roll-up strategy with with a of you know existing education businesses with one single with one single brand. Good examples of that are companies like Pluralsight, Skillsoft, or you've got people trying to, to acquire individual different assets covering different sectors within education, A Star, K to twelve, supplementary stuff company like Knowledge Universe, which was Mike Milken's original baby, where he aggregated all kinds of ed tech, early stage K to 12 in one company. Generally, they're very flexible. Very few have been successful because I think the maturity of the sector is showing that you need to be specialized in order to be successful in this space. Or you have super specialized, as I've mentioned, the independent um, kind of single subsector focus, common back office, Groups like Laureate, which is one of the, the premier uh, private university groups that aggregated a number of universities around the world. Mixed bag in terms of quality, very unsuccessful IPO, but have demonstrated that there is a market for that sort of uh, product, not necessarily the way they've gone about it. Galileo is also very, very successful tertiary education business. And Inspired is a K-12 company set up by an ex Providence private equity principle, where from 2013 until today, he's acquired 55 schools, created a company that has about $180 million in EBITDA from a pure M&A strategy. At the absolute extreme end of pure capitalist approach to education, how you make money, 
with very little regard to the actual uh, pedagogy and the rest of it. And that's kind of an, another interesting paradigm that you're going to come into more and more. I'll move on to the, uh, the next slide. I kind of can skip over this one relatively quickly in terms of um, the key education trends. Generation Z, far more au fait with using digital uh, to complement in-class learning. Um, the ability to, to have a, an education technology product that can, can provide that mobile first learning mechanism that people are used to, but also integrated with in-class learning, that's the key. Um, the future of work is another key thing that's been discussed. You know, you need to have an education system that can provide skills for kids to actually be able to survive in the real world. You know, I'm in a country where the, the education system is still very Victorian and isn't necessarily preparing kids for the tech savvy world uh, that you need to be in or the project based learning. And that also comes speaks to the different types of curriculum and how that's coming into fore and how that's evolving. Um, um, okay, just, on yeah. the screen, just want everyone to know that on Thursday, purposely at four o'clock, um, we're because we want children to join uh, this discussion is we're going to talk about these generational Gen Z um, and a really great lineup of people. Uh, this is not the full slide, but it's just as a place marker, as a shout out. Uh, I'll go back to your, your presentation. Oh, thanks. No problem at all. Um, yeah, I'll definitely try to join. Um, final, final aspects of this is the interna internationalization of education not only in K-12, which has seen a massive, massive growth in terms of um, attendees and number of schools, but just also the pathways component of more and more students globally going to university in other parts of the world. So Chinese students coming to Australia, UK, US, Indian students, Russian students, et cetera, they've now become core components of how universities make money. And in the UK, private schools in particular have really taken to trying to attract international students to come in. For many of them, it's a way to subsidize operations for domestic students. For others, it's just a pure money-making exercise. Um, we can skip over the next kind of six and seven slides. It's not really gonna add that much beyond what I've already, what I've already spoken about. Um, slide nine though is probably um, the best slide in terms of giving you an overview of how we view as an investor the major asset classes and what to look for and what we look for. Um, you know, I can break down into the preschools, K-12, higher ed, all very different in terms of capital outlay and scalability. Um, enrichment is a huge business, particularly in Asia. Um, it's, you know, it's, as, it's almost as big as the actual education sector over there. And I can see that evolving more and more in the West. Vocational training, we've mentioned already, in terms of on the job training, skills-based training and ed tech we, we've already discussed as well. So then moving on finally to the investment filters. Um, this I think is useful just to kind of give you an overview as to how different types of investors approach these sectors. What, what are they looking for exactly? And what can you expect from them? You know, the, the core thing that people like about education in particular, bricks and mortar, you know, preschools, K-12, higher ed, is that it's negative working capital and you've got long-term revenue visibility. In September, all the fees are paid up predominantly for most of the year. So you've got predictability already by September as to what your year-end numbers are gonna look like. Very rare to find any business like this. Um, and a negative working capital scenario is, is, is also interesting, but it, it does mean that you need good cash management solutions within your, within your school business. Um, Barriers to entry, you know, preschools, not really that difficult to enter. To be honest, the curriculum is obviously, is obviously difficult, but that can be bought off the shelf and it's not hard to, to build, build a kind of a, a decent business on that side of things. Same thing with enrichment centers as well. Um, as I said, the whole sector is very much dependent on supply and demand in, uh, in your different subsectors and different geographies. Uh, so K-12 in particular in the UK, in Asia and certain geographies, Way more, uh, way more demand than supply, which leads to some interesting pricing issues. Um, another core area that people like about the education sector is that prices generally have risen higher than inflation. In the UK, private school fees have risen about 75% above inflation over the course of the last 12, 15 years or so. So it's a tremendous business. 
Government regulation is also a critical component, again, dependent on the region. China in particular is like regulatory quicksand, so it's very difficult for you to, to do anything there unless you're nimble and have got good government relations. Everywhere else, generally, it's fairly straightforward. Preschool, pretty unregulated. That's why the barriers to entry are pretty low. K-12, a little more difficult. Higher ed, again, a bit more tricky as well. Um, yeah, that's probably kind of run through as quickly as possible. That's kind of the core... 60,000 feet overview of the investment. Yeah. And um, it, like, uh, uh, again, how appreciative are we that you were able to kind of, in the short time that we have, give an intro to the investment landscape with education, which of course warrants, as we say, uh, a deep dive all on its own. So stay tuned for future uh participation in that sector. What I'd like to do now is two things. Um, Mark, if you wanna just put up the slide, I wanna just put up the resource slide for people with COVID right before we get into the Q&A and then mention that we have um, a slide that Adam Weinberg, president of Denison, wasn't able to join us. And so he did an interview that talked about um, liberal arts college and uh, some facets around that environment and issue. And so I invite people to, to go and listen to his interview and he'll be participating later. Um, the yeah. sample... Can you put these resources on the uh, in in the education? Group? Yeah, I'll put them in there. I just want to quickly explain that there are resources here for that focus. This is just a sampling for people. It's curated. It is. It focuses on uh, early childhood. There are resources for K-12 resources for adolescents, teens. It also has resources not only in education, virtual learning, but resources on health, wellness, and mental health. And for anybody wanting to do their own search, I put keywords at the bottom that can be used for Google searches and other searches. So what I'd like to do is open up Q and A, Mark. How much time do we have for Q and A? I think at this point, it's just it's there's no formal end, so we can just okay. Uh, and before, I, uh, right before, if speakers have to get off, I just want to uh, once again thank everybody one for their participation and also thank everybody who joined for their participation. And uh, I look forward to continuing the modules as we move forward with deep dives with education. So with that, I'm gonna open it up for anybody to take all over with questions that they may have. Well, maybe Mark, can I ask one? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just mindful, Amit has to leave in a moment. So if you have anything on investment, you may wanna hit him. I actually did wanna ask about valuations there on the private side and what he's saying, but also to thank all the speakers, it was phenomenal. <coughs> um, at valuation yeah. in the private space? Eye-wateringly expensive, depending on your region um, and, 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 and some of the growth profiles you're seeing. I mean, K to 12, you're seeing multiples ranging between 17 to 22 times one year forward EBITDA, and that can range from individual schools to, to groups groups of, of assets. Toro Street generally a bit lower, ranging between nine to 11X. EdTech, it's, you know, if it's, it, Baiju is a big example of that in India, BYJU, huge business that's received, you know, tremendous amount of investment from SoftBank, not that that means anything, but, you know, a, a ridiculous valuation. So, I mean, you've got to take a call here with some of these, you've got to hold your nose a little bit particularly depending on the geography in which the, the business has exposure to. But you know, for the right companies, you, you get in at expensive pricing, but generally the exits that you're seeing tend to justify an expensive entry. But it is a very expensive sector, there's no doubt. Public markets are the same way, so that's, they didn't escape it in this, in this Absolutely. space. Absolutely. And the, the comps are quite difficult because the public market comps 
aren't necessarily representative of some of the private uh, market transactions that you're seeing. The Chinese ed tech companies tend to uh, move the needle far too far to the right. And you get a lot of entrepreneurs within this space who use that as the barometer in terms of where they think they should price their businesses. So you get a lot of spectacular failures and spectacularly expensive companies that don't necessarily justify the valuations, but also many that do. And you know, you've got to hold your nose. And you know, I, one thing I, oh, go I, ahead. I'm traveling, I don't know if Lisa's still here, but when I was in China, there was a Chinese family office and I didn't know you on that. I didn't have this route. Uh, They'll, make, they'll pay strategic premiums. He wants to bring the best of education and then just you know, translate it into China or you know, distribute it into China, in, at least, uh, roughly speaking. And, uh, and that's, I'm, I've been seeing this theme a lot and we're gonna talk about sovereign wealth and, and impact of China. I'm just cu curious, you've mentioned it briefly and then you had, you had a stint in Singapore on it. You know, what, what are you seeing? In, you know, you, uh, you know, it's also as a way of differentiating competitiveness. Uh, we're having our, we're having a setback year where China doesn't seem like it's missing much of a beat, um, and that's China. But what any, any comment on that on the Asian opportunity set for investment or impact? Yeah, I mean it's huge. Many of the trends that you're seeing, um, particularly in, in the in the bricks and mortar K to twelve tertiary preschool space largely being driven by growth in Asian middle class. The, the large mega trend of, you know, um, millions of, of people ascending upwards on the back of higher salaries, more opportunities and the rest of it. And the first thing that they spend their money on is better education for their kids in order to ensure that they can go to better schools, go to university abroad, and then the cycle continues basically. So Asia itself as a market is probably at the vanguard of what you're seeing in, in, um, in K to 12 preschool and tertiary. Education technology is very much focused on India and Vietnam. They're core countries where you're seeing a huge amount of innovation, India, India in particular, and that's where valuations can be very, very difficult. But undoubtedly Asia is the market to keep an eye on. China itself has got, you know, 400 million, uh, 400 million uh, uh, K-12 school kids. So not only is there an incredible market for K-12 bricks and mortar, but then all the ancillary ed tech that goes alongside supporting them. So, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I think the U.S. Is, is obviously a tremendous market for ed tech companies. For private schools and the rest of it, it's very, very far behind. Um where else? Europe is a laggard. Europe's very, very strong when it comes to vocational tech, uh, ed tech and focus on that space, but generally it lags behind Asia in terms of where we're seeing a lot of innovation. And I would be less than remiss, everybody probably expects me to say this, that I know that this is a group that is very interested in ROI and I just want to keep it the focus also on we're dealing with human beings and to not forget investment in social impact with heart rate of return, which just for the record, I am working with some organizations on putting together metrics. So we have a return on investment, but creating metrics for heart rate of return. So just to put it all in proper perspective, other questions? Maybe to that. One comment. Go ahead, Mark. I guess one comment is in terms of defining a continuum, it's actually interesting because it's a known as a continuous sequence where elements are not that different from one another, but the extremes can be really distinct. And I guess one of my takeaways has to do with so many changes in the educational landscape now and really how important it is to be super adaptable. Um, and this is an example in this program, how we can kind of practice those skills and learn from one another. I'll make one plug, actually two plugs. One is um, in terms of thinking forward, the whole role of mentorship and pairing students of different ages all across the life continuum 
um, would be a really interesting way to expand what good models are out there and how we can better utilize the process of mentorship um, with vulnerable populations and with one another. And secondly, I'd be curious, um, the health and wellness overview um, and how this interconnects in education because all of these topics are um, indeed impacting one another. And so it might be worth investing more of a focus on um, the health and wellness perspective going forward post COVID. Well, can I just jump on your mentorship? I'm a first to go to college kid and it was Lou Mitchell. I just want his name to be, always be in, enshrined who took me under his wing. Uh, class of 57 at Denison, gave me this GAP scholarship. If I didn't have those mentors, mm -hmm. I just wish I had a mentor that, I wish I had an internship at a law firm, so I would have skipped that law firm uh, chapter. But uh, <laughs> but it's so key. And that's really what Denison Connecting came, was inspired by him and then Michigan and this. So that that's definitely part of the DNA here, to your point. And I know, I'm, I bet MJ will talk about the mental health side. As a matter of fact, you know, speaking of mental health, there's an article in the New York Times this morning talking about uh, health and wellness of our teachers. And I would invite people to give that a read this morning. Okay. Uh, I was just, Sarah, I was just gonna say to your point about, I understand focusing on the ROI, but what kind of ROI can you put on, you know, yeah. ending racism, sexism, xenophobia, and all of that? you know, getting in early and I was mentioning and teaching our kids that, that, that and I understand, and, you know, there were some great people who popped in saying there's a lot of pushback on that, unfortunately, because a, a lot of people just don't think it does, it exists. Um, but what's the ROI of, you know, ending racism and sexism and xenophobia and all that stuff? We won't end it, not in my lifetime, but making a dent in that. And how can you put a, a price on that because <laughs> racism is taught, sexism is taught, xenophobia is taught. People are not born racist. And so I think there's a very good thing that you pointed out that this is not just about dollars and cents. This is about putting the right things in our kids' minds. Like the last thing I'll say, if you, if you saw the movie Betrayal with Deborah Winger and Tom Berenger 30 years ago, the kid would go, five-year-old kid, they'd, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray. My, and then at the end, she said, and, we'll, and I pray that all the N-word and Jews burn in hell. And they said, good job, honey. You know, like, so what do we do to get to kids early to show them that that's not right? Because it's not their fault 15 years later that they're racist. It's what they were taught in, at an early age. So what can we do now? To, to stop that. And I know it's it's hard, but we need to have a really big, big bullhorn and be very unreasonable in order to change it like that. And I appreciate, you know how much I appreciate that contribution. And to that end, I put in the chat, um, I actually am working on a project. I'm the project manager with a school district that's making that mandatory doing the human development at the same time as anti-racist curriculum. So I'll, I'd love to talk to anybody about that. And we're getting inquiries with other states. Are there any other questions that people may have? Um, as I said, and Mark had said, we invite you to uh, do the follow-up with the future of work where Gary Bowles will be speaking specifically on the education. And the difference will be, I believe he'll be speaking more to the issues of skill sets that were touched upon um, today. Any other questions or comments? Again, I can't thank Leslie and Chris enough for all their support. Eddie, I want to part, you said to wait four minutes for the education event to start. So uh, yeah. any, any wrap up debrief thoughts, questions, and what we'd like to see going forward? So I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna touch on a point that, that's been going on the on the on the app and it also MJ had a had a big um, sort of addition to is that DNI diversity and inclusion is uh, is is uh, is a fairly big topic particularly also for higher education. Now it's um it's the 
the saying goes something like, it's easier to change the course of history than the history of course. But uh, the, and these higher institutions are very, very difficult to change. But it, it, it sounds like from like a McKinsey study that actually in the corporate world, the ones who have a, a, a board with a higher diversity and higher inclusion mantra do better and are, in, in, are, are high, you know, are in terms of RRI and in terms of uh, profitability. And that's that I think we should all strive for in our in our particularly higher education, but also down down the line. But this 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 goes to a high higher education study. Uh, um, th they should really try to focus on more diversity and inclusion in that, particularly also because um, I, you know we saw the Ohio statistic that are a large drop off rate. The drop off rate for particularly uh, blacks and and Latinx uh, population. Is far higher uh, than for than for whites and Asians in in in, uh, in in higher ed. So so the the percentage of faculty that is black and Latinx is also in the low teens versus the higher pro rata. For women, it's thirty three percent, which is lower than their pro rata. All that all those things, I think that that the, in terms of higher education, that's something to strive for. Um, higher diversity and inclusion improves the balance lessens the, the, the all kinds of, of negative connotations, xenophobia, what have you, and, and increases the ROI of, uh, of these institutions. 100%. Exactly. 100%. Okay. In diversity, there's strength. Yeah. That's exactly right. Going Very soft. interesting. Thanks, guys, for all this. It's... Uh, very interesting space, both as an investor and a, and a human being. Yeah, what, like I said, um, the, the hope and the, is to move forward with this being the first of many on education where we, like I said, today provided an overview and the continuum of ed, and we'll hopefully go into some deep dives. And I just, I wanna make a plug for people who are in our own community. Um, Mark Jarvis, uh, Charles, Witt. there are so many people with so many incredible resources. So I look forward to showcasing some of our own in our own community too. Great. Yep. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Leslie and Chris. I know how to leave and everybody who could participate. We're going to turn this around and, and put it up for, and share and see where this what this catalyzes. Sounds Great good. job, Sarah. Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. everybody. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again.